Hello everyone, Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com. This is Trading Simplified. So what are we talking about? Well, whenever the market gets choppy, and as a trend follower, you can't make any money in a choppy market. It's difficult. I find myself, in addition to overtrading, I find myself looking to the wisdom of Jesse Livermore. I thought I would share that with you today. Specifically, we're going to look at reminiscence of a stock operator. And there's so much in there. I think we'll just take it one chapter at a time, and today we'll take a look at the first couple of chapters. There, I have a brief market timing update. We did get an official signal in the queues, and the system does show promise in the queues, and I'm going to show you that in a couple of minutes. Housekeeping, by the way, I do take requests. It makes my job a lot easier knowing what I'm going to cover ahead of time. If I can't fit them into this show, I will cover them in my weekly show, which is usually on Thursdays, except for sometimes not on Thursdays if it's a holiday shortened week, but usually on Thursdays at 6 p.m. Central, DaveLandry.com slash webinar to sign up. If you need to reach me, DaveLandry.com slash contact. If you want slides from this presentation and all the other presentations combined, go to DaveLandry.com slash stock charts. Lots of systems and setups and psychology and money management and all kinds of stuff in there. Also, I'll give you all three of my books in PDF format. If you want to follow me on Twitter, at T Following Moron. Now, let's jump right into mine, the trade. So again, I want to talk about the wisdom of Jesse Livermore. And I do plan on pulling, on, pulling from more sources. But I think the best place to start is Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. And I like this version here because there's some extra commentary that's added in. It sort of gives you a little background information. Like I assume that sugar was a commodity when we talk about trading sugar, but he's actually talking about trading the sugar refining company, the American sugar refining company. So little details like that really help to kind of help you to wrap your head around things. Now, Jesse Livermore began his career as a quote boy and the quotes would come in from the New York Stock Exchange over a ticker and somebody would yell out the prices and Jesse Livermore along with other quote boys would write down the prices on a chalkboard. Now Livermore became fascinated with the prices. His other fellow quote boys could really care less but he was really into it and he said he was good with arithmetic. He said he completed three years of arithmetic in one year. Now, the highest education that he had was likely an eighth grade education. But nonetheless, he was good with numbers and figures, and he saw reoccurring patterns. In other words, he began to learn how to read the tape. Not paper trading in a sense where he imagined all these profits, as a lot of people who paper trade do. And as I often say, I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader, except for one guy who's been trading for two weeks, but that one doesn't count. Anyway, he held himself accountable, so to speak, by putting his prediction down in a notebook and then watching to see what would happen and then making observations, making observations on whether or not his predictions came true. Now, after the market closed instead of going home he would study his notes six months later he was having lunch and one of the bucket shop boys had a hot tip on a stock and he asked livermore if he had any money and livermore said why he says well i want to go play the stock and he's like well how can you play the stock you need thousands of dollars so livermore was a quote boy in an actual brokerage where you needed thousands of dollars to participate. And the boy explained to him that there were bucket shops where you could trade in a shoestring, using their terminology. So Livermore said, well, hang on a second. Let me check my, my book, my dope sheets, as, as he called them. And he saw that the company, I think it was Burlington, was moving higher. And he figured that it would continue to move higher. So he decided to go ahead and play along and gave the guy his three dollars and fifteen cents and they ended up doubling the money now from that point forward he was hooked and he found himself spending a lot of time in the bucket shops now the way the bucket shop works is 
when you place your order, instead of placing the trade, he buckets your order, so to speak. So no actual trades are ever made. So they knew the psycho psychology of the players, or as Livermore calls it, human weakness. And because they knew people would act in a certain way, the house took 100% of the risk. So again, they never did make a real trade. Now, when I first read Livermore years ago, I didn't understand why the bucket shops were so anxious to put the trader out of business. But then over the years, I realized, well, hang on, the only way they made money because they weren't placing actual trades was for the clients to lose money. And they made it very easy for that to happen. So they would entice them with a lot of margin. They just had to put up a little bit of money and they could buy a whole lot of stock. Now, Livermore went on to say that the fluctuations took care of the shoestring. So if somebody's trading on a shoestring, what would happen is because you're on margin, all it had to move was three points or so against you, depending on the margin, it might only be three quarters of a point, and you were knocked out of the trade. So the bucket shops had an advantage in that they were taking advantage of human weakness or human nature. And again, they used margin to help squeeze the money out of their clients. Now, there was actually some advantages to a bucket shop, as Livermore would later find out. Traders got instant fills at the last quoted price, unless it was an inactive stock. Then the next quote would be where you got your fill. So if sugar or whatever was, was quoted at 100, assuming that sugar was active, you could buy it at 100. The real market might be 101 or 99 or 98, but you were able to buy it at whatever that last quote price was for active symbols again. Now, again, they would automatically close your order out once you exceeded your margin. So you couldn't get stung for more than you put up. And because all of the, the orders, so to speak, were fictitious anyway, the bucket shop was able to control all this and not lose money and wipe you out in the meantime. It's not like you had to put up more margin. Now, one by one, because Livermore was beating them at their game, they began to ban Livermore. And there was one shop that was kind of a more reputable firm. And they began to handicap Livermore severely. So if the price quote was 90, they would charge him 91. And, uh, on the way in and on the way out, and it wouldn't give him as much margin to trade with. So according to Livermore, he had to make two and a quarter points per trade. So the extra eighth, I don't know if that was commissions or was a point and an eighth they eventually raised his slippage to. So they built in slippage for Livermore. Now, as I said earlier, from watching the tape, and getting very hands-on with it, he began to learn reoccurring patterns and be able to, was able to follow the trend. And one thing that he learned was there is nothing new in Wall Street. There can't be because speculation is as old as the hills. That's why my favorite books on trading are 100 years old or more. I haven't done it lately, but sometimes later at night on the weekend, if my wife goes to bed early, I'll get on eBay and I'll look for old old books on trading. I know, you want to party with me. <laughs> but anyway, Livermore went on to say that whatever happens in the stock market today has happened before. And that's why, as technicians, we study these reoccurring patterns and we look for similar patterns in the future. Of course, there's always a reason for the fluctuations, but the tape does not concern itself with the why and the wherefore. It doesn't go into explanations. I didn't ask the tape why when I was 14, and I don't ask it today at 40. The reason for what a certain stock does day to day may not be known for two or three days or weeks or months. But what the dickens doesn't matter. Don't confuse the issue with facts. Is it going up or is it going down? Your business with the tape is now, not tomorrow. The reason can wait. But you must act instantly or be left. Time and again, I see this happen. You remember that hollow tube went down three points the other day. And he went on to say that hollow tube stock had dropped and then later found out why because they cut the dividend. 
Now, what Livermore was seeing in the bucket shop was a snapshot of quotes, so to speak. So the bucket shops, if he was making a little chart in his notebook, it would look something like this for a stock. In reality, it probably looked a little bit more like this. And when he got to New York, eventually, he found that out. The tick marks reminded me of a story that I told in Trading Full Circle. Technical analysis so easy, even a mountain man can do it. I was hired by a medical doctor who used to work for a biotechnology company and was now with a startup hedge fund. And he wanted to bring technical analysis into the hedge fund. So he asked me if I would run scans for bow ties on biotechnology stocks. And I, and I explained that I would take that one step further and find him stocks and look for stocks and do all of his technical analysis. And he just, he had, he kind of dug the way I did the, the bow ties in the proper order. Anyway, one day we were talking and he said that he was out hiking and he met a mountain man, literally a mountain man. And they became friendly and the mountain man said, what do you do? And he explained that he was working with a hedge fund, a startup hedge fund, and they were going to actually use charts to help them make the decisions for biotechnology companies. He was going to use his knowledge of the field. And then along with me, I was going to help him with the timing. And anyway, he met this mountain man. He says, oh, I have an interest in stocks. And he's like, well, really? Yeah. And so he brings him to his, his cabin or whatever. And he, he would literally make these ticks with a big fat carpenter's pencil. And he said, this guy seemed to be successful as a trader. And this is a, a case of be as close to the markets as you need to be, but no closer. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is Livermore was, be, was able to beat the bucket shops because he could read the tape as it related to the bucket shops. But when he got to New York, which he eventually had to do because he ran out of bucket shops, he found out that the game was much different. So Livermore went from being a quote boy to the bucket shops, from the bucket shops to the NYSE. He blew up there, he borrowed money, and then he went back to the bucket shops using disguises in some cases so they wouldn't kick him out and then eventually once he got a stake and was kicked out of the last bucket shop he went back to the NYSE. Now one thing that happened which forced him to go back to the NYSE was he had a hunch but this hunch was backed by price. Now I know he has some hunches later on in the book and I don't remember if all those were exactly backed by price, and we'll get to that over time. But this particular hunch was backed by price. I knew something was wrong somewhere, but I couldn't spot it exactly. But if something was coming and I didn't know where from, I couldn't be on my guard against it. That being the case, I'd better be out of the market. Now, this is intuition, but this intuition was backed by the fact that he noticed that prices just didn't seem to be going down on sugar, the sugar refining company. And he was heavily, 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 heavily short. He had about 10 grand in profits, if memory serves. And he decided to close out his position. And what happened was the next quote that came through was about eight points higher. And he later found out that he was part of a bucket shop run, but he was able to get out right before they jacked the prices up. Let's say a bucket shop is down $40,000 on a short position because the clients there have all shorted it. What they'll do is they'll manipulate the market to squeeze them out. So they would contact New York and place actual trades and sort of paint the tape, so to speak, so that they would wipe out the shorts and not have to pay them. And if they could do that for less than what they owe the shorts, they would come out whole. You get a lot of good quotes from Livermore. As I was going live with this, I noticed that I had about 10 more that I didn't include in this presentation. And I'm going to probably work those in to future presentations. But one thing that's interesting was I was playing a system and not a favorite stock or backing opinion. So basically, his system was to look at price and capitalize on price movements. Nothing more, nothing less. So he was 
one of the first known technicians. Now, he didn't confuse the issue with facts. One of my favorite sayings is, don't confuse the issue with facts. The whys don't matter, as Livermore said. Only price matters. And then also play your own game. He was influenced by others, or others tried to influence, I should, I should say, to do certain things. But rather, he played his own game. And if he were to be presented with a rumor, he would look at the tape to confirm whether or not the rumor appears to be true, at least basis the tape. Because if there is some sort of rumor, without digressing too far, somebody's likely already buying the stock or selling, whatever the case may be. Now, one thing he learned was be as close to the market as you need to be, but no closer. And unfortunately, he was forced out of the bucket shops, but he knew he could beat the bucket shops at their own game. And he was sort of one step removed from the market there. Now, what I'm saying here in today's day and age is like, don't take a position trade and then watch every single tick. That'll, that'll make you crazy. And you'll more than likely not follow your plan. Now, he quickly found out that the map is not the territory. Just because he beat the bucket shop didn't mean that he could transfer that knowledge to the NYSE. Yes, his tape reading really helped, but then he quickly found out because of the, when you're trading actual markets, there's slippage and then there's a delay. And when you place your order and when you get your fill, all of that was instantaneous. And there was no, again, slippage in the bucket shops. So Livermore had to change his game and, and move from being more of a scalper to a bigger picture position trader. Now, as he began to learn more and more, he said, in fact, I always made money when I was sure I was right before I began. What beat me was not having the brains enough to stick to my own game. That is to play the market only when I was satisfied that the precedents favored my play. There's a time for all things, but I didn't know it. And that is precisely what beats up so many men in Wall Street who are very far from being in the main sucker class. There's the plain fool who does the wrong thing at all times everywhere, but there's a Wall Street fool who thinks he must trade all the time. No man can always have adequate resources for buying or selling stocks daily or sufficient knowledge to make his play an intelligent play. That's one of the problems that I have re-encountered throughout my career. I sort of pull in my horns or become bearish, whatever the case may be, when the market turns down, might do a little shorting, but then eventually in a bear market like we're in now, or coming out of now at least, there's gonna be some really, really choppy times where there's nothing to be done. I do pretty good sitting on my hands when it comes to position trading. And as I've said quite often lately, I saw an old presentation where I went 52 days trigger to trigger in my public commentary, in my trading service, with setup. So that's like two and a half months of no trading. And I'm actually kind of proud of that. The desire for constant action, irrespective of underlying conditions, is responsible for many losses in Wall Street, even among the professionals who feel that they must take home money every day. That's me. I'm always trying to pull money out the market. But a lot of times I just need to sit in my hands as though they were working for regular wages. And as we get further and further into this, there's going to be more and more psychology that will come up. For instance, a stock operator has to fight a lot of expensive enemies within himself. And that's one reason why I spend so much time talking about trading psychology. Now, here's some takeaways. He did his homework, okay? Instead of going home or doing something else at lunch other than getting a quick lunch, he would study his notebook. And his first trade was, was based on a tip, but it was because the tip was confirmed by his dope sheet. So let's say you feel great about a company. Well, don't just rush out and buy it. Make sure the tape reflects what you're feeling. Now, he was a price purist. He only concerned himself with price fluctuations. Again, one of the first known technicians. The tape knows. And as I said earlier, his point was that this company, Tube, dropped three points and then later found out why. He also discovered that patterns reoccur. Price And price action begets 
price action. So once you began to recognize price action, you could use that price action to help you place your trades. In other words, setups. He wanted to increase his size, but he realized that risking $10 when that's all you had in the world is worse than risking one million when you had another million salted away. His words. So if you don't have a lot of money and you lose it all, you still lost all your money. It's his point. So he traded his own system because he knew that he, it should be in here somewhere, could not influence prices. Now he did exit a huge position on a hunch, which you have to be very careful with. But, again, that was backed by the tape action. So there's a lot with Livermore. The more you study him, the more you find. And here are some more takeaways. He discovered that the map was not the territory when he changed games. So be careful with knowledge transference. He couldn't transfer directly all of his bucket shop information over to trading. What I see in my business a lot is... Doctors or lawyers or automatic transmission mechanics or any of the highly trained or skilled people automatically think they could transfer that knowledge to trading. It's two completely different animals. But in his case, it was a bucket shop versus an actual market. Now, one thing I picked up on that he sort of said in passing is that at one point he had a roll of 10K from going back to the bucket shops, but he only had $2,500 when he returned to New York. Now, he did say that he didn't always make money in the bucket shops, but my question is, why did he have a 75% drawdown in the bucket shops, which was his game? So, was he breaking his rules, or what happened there? Okay, let's shift gears and talk about the TFM 10% system in the queues. We had a buy signal last Friday, so just real quick, the buy line, so to speak, is Landry percent of close. Parameters are 90 and 50. That means 50 weeks and 90% of that closing high. So I plotted 100% of closing high in here so you can see what this buy line is based on. Now, to buy, you need a close above the buy line and you need two bars of Landry light. So if we zoom the chart in, bar one would be here and bar two would be here. Now this chart is not updated, but we ended up closing the week way up here on the queues. So it continued to meet the criteria. Had the market dropped down here, it would have been not a signal. But if you look at this week's action, you could see that we had, again, two bars of Landry light, okay? And a close above the buy line. If you had the Landry light indicator down here, bar one and bar two. So go in. And watch last week's presentation. See my website homepage, DaveLander.com, and I have updates on this. By the way, there's also a bear market update page. You can check for posts like this. Whenever I see signals, I post them there as soon as they occur. So this is a spreadsheet. And the reason this system works is because it occasionally gets you out of the market when you lose a lot of money. If the market just goes up for years and years and years, then it's going. the market is going to beat this system. This system only works when you have the occasional 50% or more haircut in the market. And as you can see, we had some pretty big slides here. The last being the pandemic. Now, as I've said ad nauseum, the pandemic signal turned out to be a whipsaw, but as you can see here, being out of the market and watching it drop about 30% is a lot better than living through that whip song. And as I've said, I nausea met a friend visiting around that time and he was not very happy. So again, the designer's intent for this was to avoid the occasional 50% or more haircut. Here's some things I mentioned last week. Go and watch last week's presentation for more on that. That's all my time. If you need to reach me again, DaveLeonard.com slash contact. There's the other information. Would love to have you each week in my webinar, so sign up for those. Sign up for one, and you're signed up for all. I want to thank everybody for watching, and may the trend be with you. Hey, guys. Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, 
hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.